Um, well, thank you very much. And um, I'm going to be talking to you about the state. And this is extremely important today, because the state is under attack. I think most of you know this. We are currently in a major worldwide, not every part of the world, but in many parts of the world, um, retrenching of the state. And this is mainly for two reasons. So we're in the period of austerity. The first reason is the one that most of you know because you read it in the papers every day that we're told that public debt has been too high. We need to reduce it because this is bad for future taxpayers, future generations that actually have to pay interest on that debt. I'm actually not going to talk about that. That would be a whole other talk, very controversial one. But the other reason that you're told, and actually I should say something about that, that I really welcome all of you to go actually out and look at some data and you will actually see and most of you probably know this, that the real cause of the financial crisis was private debt, not public debt. And I just have to say that because it's not said enough. So what I'm actually talking about, though, is the second reason that the state has been under attack. And this is much longer than just recently, um, since 2007 of the financial crisis. I would say it's about the last 25 years that we've been told that the reason that we actually have to make the state smaller and make the private sector and the market larger is because what actually drives growth, we are told, is business. And all really that um, the government should do is if you want um, correct um, failures of the market where they arise, they should be um, funding schools and hospitals and roads and you know, digging ditches and those kind of things, of course. But really, with the state, you know, when the state is too large, uh, the economists often use this word, the Hobbesian Leviathan, right? So the state is the big monster. What actually happens is that growth, dynamic growth, capitalist-driven growth actually um, gets um, smaller. And so if we want more Googles, you know, why are there no Googles in Europe? We're told it's because the state is too large. So what should we do to have our own Facebooks, our own Amazons, and not have this just coming from the US? We should make the state smaller and the market larger. Um, often, we all have sort of in our heads these cartoon images of, you know, the private sector is potentially very fast, um, dynamic, creative, and the state sector, which of course we need, because again, the schools, the hospitals, the roads, we all need that, is, you know, inherently sort of bureaucratic, um, slower, inertial. It's a dinosaur and a leviathan, as I mentioned before. Now, this cartoon image, which many of us have in our head, okay, the state is necessary, but it's, again, slower, less dynamic. Um, I recently found from a history book that the, that the use of these cartoon images are actually quite forceful in terms of making things happen. So for example, when the country of Mexico was basically stolen from California, because much of what California and Texas, for example, are today, were once part of Mexico, they actually had to create a cartoon image of the Mexican as a lazy, um, you know, person who, and so we have to justify this theft by creating this cartoon image, which uh, many people have or know about. Of course, it's a, it's, a terribly, it's a terrible image, but it was actually created on purpose in that period in order to justify the theft. So this same cartoon, I actually want to um, convince you, has actually been created on purpose uh, for ideological reasons. And it's, it has a huge damage in terms of how economists, and I'm sure you're not going to be surprised to know that economists don't really understand certain things, but economists, I would say, by actually um, portraying this image constantly by, again, saying that all we need the state is in order to fix markets, have actually completely limited um, how we actually understand the role of the public sector in the economy, in the capitalist economy. Now, first of all, let's start, again, sort of undermining this cartoon image. I mean, most of you, uh, probably, or many of you probably have an iPhone. I don't. Um, if you actually take apart the iPhone, um, basically, every little bit of it was actually funded by the state, okay? So the state has not just, if you want, uh, funded the schools that have created, you know, that have actually funded the workers who have um, done the research behind the iPhone. It actually funded directly the internet, uh, GPS, uh, the touchscreen display, the um, communication technology behind it. It also funded directly um, through sort of public venture capital schemes like the Small Business Innovation Research Scheme in the US, some of the most innovative companies. So Compaq, Intel, Apple received their early stage finance from the state, not from um, private venture capital. In fact, private venture capital, I will try to convince you later, is much less risk taking than we're often told. So for example, it tends to enter sort of 20 years after the state tends to fund the most uncertain and risky part of the knowledge base, on top of which it then surfs. Um, and you know, many people think, okay, fine, but you're just talking sort of you know, basic research and the upstream stuff. But you know, 
we want to know about commercialization and business and you know of course yes the state is needed to do the basic research but in terms of the dynamic growth of course we need a bigger private sector well let's go look at pharmaceuticals um, companies like Pfizer if you actually take every single medicine that has been um, invented let's just say in the last 10 years and divide them up on whether they are really innovative medicines, so new molecular entities versus just sort of me too drugs, so Viagra, different color, different dosage. And on top of that, take the new molecular entities and divide them up on whether they are really important, so priority rated or not. Um, the person who's done this is Marsha Angels. She found that 75% of the really innovative drugs, so the really radical, creative, new ways of thinking drugs were actually funded by the state directly, directly in national laboratories while private pharma was uh, focusing more on these Me Too drugs. Why? Because it's much easier to make money. It's much less risky. Um, this is fine, okay? I mean, this is not to say private pharma is bad and these NIH, National Institute of Health Laboratories, are good. The point is that this image that we have of, again, pharmaceutical industry, really dynamic, highly R&D intensive, innovative industry, that is an image which, first of all, has been able has been used by pharmaceutical companies to keep their prices so high because they justify that based on these really high R&D costs and that they're such a risky industry. Um, and, it, and it's very important to just sort of step back and say, okay, let's look at all the players in the pharmaceutical industry. Let's look at the large firms, the small firms, the different types of state funding. And let's go look at who actually took on the biggest risks because it's extremely important to say that innovation is extremely risky and uncertain. In fact, it's not just risky, it is, as I said before, uncertain. And Frank Knight is the lead thinker here who says, you know, risk is just about sort of the probability that you might win or, or, or lose the lottery. You can actually calculate a probability distribution on that. Uncertainty is like the probability that your wife or, or husband will divorce you, the probability that you'll win or lose a war. You actually can't write probability distributions around that. That's inherently really uncertain, and this is innovation. So who is actually taking on that uncertainty is extremely important, because they are really sort of you know, risking losing everything. In fact, something like 90% of R&D projects actually fail. Um, and the irony, of course, is that we're always told that the US is the market model, Europe is you know, big and heavy and very bureaucratic. In fact, it's more or less the opposite in terms of innovation. The US has had a very visible hand, not an invisible Adam Smithian hand, in terms of how it has funded innovation. And many of the examples I explained before were, in fact, coming from the US. And again, as I said before, economists have really missed this, because by always focusing just on the problems of the market and saying, OK, the state has to come in, for example, some of you who might have taken an um, Economics 101 class know that this market failure perspective basically says that there's these problems in the market that might be related to, for example, when you have a public good. So basic research is like a public good. It's really hard to appropriate, and hence you need the state to actually come in and fund that. Um, that's a very limited view of what the state has actually done with research. But anyway, that's a, about sort of putting patches and coming in where there might be a problem. There's also a whole other perspective called um, that looks at you know, failures in the system so that um, you might, ha you know, it's not just a question of if you want producing more knowledge, but you also have to make sure that knowledge diffuses so the state will be necessary to come in and sort of create the right framework conditions, make sure you have the right diffusion of information between universities, say, and industry, and the state can help that. Um, my main point, really, is that this is completely missing one of the key roles that the state has played, which has been much more in terms of market maker, market shaper, not just market fixer, and in fact, a lead risk taker. Um, so in fact, when you think about risk, um, there's two things to say. One is often it's very high in the beginning. So the beginning of any sector like biotechnology or nanotechnology, it's much more risk in the beginning. And what we find, in fact, in terms of these state investments is that, is that you know, the state was willing to actually come in in the beginning. And venture capital, as I said before, for example, in, in biotechnology came in something like 15 years later and, and made a killing. Why did it make a killing? This is very important to understand. Because innovation is so cumulative, just think of it as a curve, depending on where you then position yourself along the cumulative curve, you can actually, in theory, actually um, get the whole space underneath the curve, not just your marginal contribution. Um, you also have to think when you look at different sectors that they have different levels of risk, both in terms of technology and market risk. And so, for example, even within a particular sector like clean technology today, it's very interesting to see that venture capital is funding some of the more incremental, less risky areas. And the few places where you're actually seeing investments in that upper right-hand area tends to be state-driven 
by the way, not from the US, but mainly from countries like China, Germany, Finland, Korea, um, also some from the US. Um, but so it's, it's very important when we talk about state investment, not just spending, state investment here, in terms of actually looking at where it has um, placed itself in terms of this risk landscape. Um, now this is very important because some people, and in fact I would say that many of my friends who are Keynesian, so some of you might also know the work of Paul Krugman who's been arguing that you know, we need a stronger state right now because we're in a recession. Um, this is also limited because it's not that you just need the state to be spending in order to get you out of a recession, which is the period, by the way, when you have too little private investment spending. So this is the whole point of the Keynesians because private investment is so pro-cyclical. You need government to come in during the bust and do counter-cyclical spending. Okay, that's basically the Keynesian point, which I more or less agree with. What it misses, though, is that even in the boom, so the 1990s, when the whole dot-com thing was happening, who was leading the way? The state. Okay. Who invented the internet? Who, again, funded these very high-risk companies in the very early seed stage? It was often these government-funded programs. Um, and again, the point is not saying state is good, business is bad. That would be very foolish. The point is you have a different landscape of risk. You have different actors. And the state has often been portrayed in a way that really doesn't capture this, if you want, risk-taking potential catalyst, a creator of the knowledge economy, not just um, facilitator of it. Um, and so, and it's interesting actually because one term that Keynes used was animal spirits. In justifying why you needed more government spending, he said, this is because private investment is, is too much driven by animal spirits, which is basically your gut instincts about the future state of a sector or of an economy, and hence you often have too little of it. And so when you have too little private investment, you need the government to come in and fill the gap. But that word, animal spirits, right, it makes you, you know, think of the wolves or tigers or lions. And actually, in, in a private letter that Keynes wrote to Roosevelt, which, um, well, it's no longer private because I'm talking about it, but anyway, um, in 1938, February 1st, 1938, he said something which I think many Keynesians don't think about, which is, you know what, actually, these businesses, they're not wolves, they're not lions, they're not tigers, they're kind of domesticated animals. And part of what we need to do is, you know, make them act. Now, again, this is a very different cartoon image, a domesticated animal, like a pussycat, right? It is not this roaring lion animal spirit. So I do think words matter, and words have also sort of blinded our understanding of what the state also can do and what it has done. Um, now, most of you probably know that within finance, and of course finance as a body of thought is a major crisis now, but some little bits of it probably have some truth to it. So for example, the risk return relationship, right? So we often study why is it that um, you know, people invest, say, more in, in stocks versus bonds. That's because they're willing to take greater risk, right? Because a bond has a guaranteed return, a stock doesn't. And over the long term, at least, um, there's some evidence that the returns to stocks which have higher risk have higher returns. Now, if this is true, if there is this risk return relationship that many of us you know, think is right, well, why is it then that one of the lead risk takers um, and investors, not just spenders, um, has not been getting back a reward? Um, and this sort of comes back to the tax system. Is it enough? You know, will the tax system be enough for the state to reap back the reward for its risk taking? I would like to argue that no. Um, we can depend on the tax system to allow returns to come back for things like spending on education, spending on health, which we actually know also increase growth. And it's fine to assume that those returns will come back because if they increase growth, that means they increase incomes and the state gets back you know, part of its taxation, which then can be reinvested. I'd like to argue that in terms of these risk-taking investments that the state makes, taxation's not enough. Um, and to be provocative about it, I, why don't we think of it in terms of if the state had even earned just 1% from what it invested in the internet through DARPA, which was one of the main uh, public funding bodies that basically produced the whole internet revolution, there would be a lot more money today to be spending in green technology. Instead, we have basically empty state coffers. Um, and so there's very little radical green tech investment going on today. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting because we don't talk about this. We don't talk about, especially in the Anglo-Saxon countries, in countries like Finland and Scandinavia where um, the role of the state, I think, has been more appreciated beyond just, again, fixing markets, funding schools, digging ditches and potholes. Um, 
they have actually thought a little bit more about this. So for example, Nokia, okay, which is under, uh, has huge problems now, not because of the state, but because of its, um, if you want, <laughs> business plan strategy and how it understood the, the space, the risk space, the landscape of risk within uh, telephone, um, mobile phone um, technology. Uh, Nokia got its early funding, not again by private venture capital, but by public uh, sources called Citra. It's, it's a public funding body in Finland, and, fi and, and they kept equity. So when Nokia made it big, Citra got some money back and could then reinvest. Google, Google got, the, the algorithm behind Google was funded by an NSF grant, a National Science Foundation grant, a public grant, public research money. Um, isn't that a bit naive that we, you know, that these sort of get, you know, so Google then makes billions and nothing comes back to the NSF? I would like to, in um, I'm trying to encourage people to be thinking about that, you know, that this is a bit naive. So shouldn't we have things like income contingent loans? You get a loan from the state, fine. If you make it big, something small should come back. In Brazil, by the way, they have um, a, a public investment bank, which is very successful right now because it's not just sort of making loans. It's also um, taking equity in particular areas that it wants to develop, so biotech and renewables, and it's making 20% return on equity. Uh, the Treasury takes a huge chunk of that, redistributes in the health system, in the education system, but the part that it then keeps and gets back, it reinvests. Now this, again, this um, investment, uh, mechanism that, that then translate into a return mechanism and hence then also reinvestment mechanism is absolutely crucial to understand how investment in innovation can in fact be uh, cumulative and sustainable in the future and this is hugely important today because the state coffers are empty so we have to think more creatively on how the state can actually get back a return for its risk-taking investments. <laughs>